Hi everybody, this is the second installment of Molecular Geometries. This time I'm specifically going to talk about atoms that have expanded octets so that we get into some of the more interesting geometries. In a first video, I covered the basics that had sp2 or sp3 hybridizations on the central atom. And in this one, I'm going to include some of the situations where we start to incorporate the d orbitals into the hybridization, which means that we are looking at, again, our expanded octets. So we will be dealing with the geometries, these six in this video, that have either five or six different things hanging off of them. That is either lone pairs or other atoms. The first that I will talk about is the five different atoms hanging off of a central atom when there are no lone pairs. My example is going to be PF5, phosphorus pentafluoride, and you can see it here. So I have this molecule. I'm going to point out a couple things real quick. First of all, not every one of these atoms experiences the same surroundings as all of its other neighbors. There's two different situations you could be in on this type of molecule. You could be in what I will refer to as kind of the central a ring almost like a hula hoop around a person standing tall where you can see if I spin this around these are all in a plane all four of these things notice that if I line one of these guys up so here's a fluorine there's my phosphorus there's nothing behind it watch what happens when I rotate this now I can see that these guys the ones that I was previously calling the top and the bottom they are actually collinear it will be really important for me in future molecules to talk about how these experience different environments and so I'm just going to have that discussion now. Notice that if I look at this guy that is either the top or the bottom here, if I look at any of these neighboring other atoms that are near it, it's 90 degrees away, 90 degrees away, 90 degrees away. No matter what, there is something that is 90 degrees away from it. But if I come in and focus on one of these guys, and so let's bring one of these guys up, to one side I have something that's 90 degrees, to another side something that's 90 degrees, so far no different. But if I turn it like this, this guy now has 120 degrees on either side before something else is there. That means it actually has more room. It's not as cramped. That will be very important when we start to talk about lone pairs and where they like to hang out. Coming back to this specific molecule though, we give it the name of trigonal bipyramidal. That's coming from this idea that there's one, two, three different atoms that are making the base of a pyramid. Here's the top of the pyramid. So there's one pyramid, and then of course there's another one on the underneath, and so that's where it's bipyramidal, so trigonal bipyramidal. So now here I've turned on the electron cloud, and you can see that again, because there are no lone pairs, this electron cloud very much mimics the atoms themselves, and so the electron cloud is also trigonal bipyramidal. Now, if I want to draw this on two-dimensional paper here, like I tend to want to do, just turn that off real quick. What I like to do personally is I like to line up one, two, three, four atoms in the plane of the paper, and then I will have one solid wedge that is coming out of the plane and one that is going back behind. So I'll use my dashed wedge for that one. Alternatively, I could go ahead and I could line up one, two, three, four, again, atoms in the plane of the page, and then I can have one that's coming essentially straight out and one that's going essentially straight behind. And so I'm showing you how one might draw that as well using two dimensions. However, I, I think that this one is a little bit more confusing to look at initially, but I certainly think either are perfectly valid uh, wedge drawings. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next one, which still has five total things hanging off of it, except one of those things is going to be a lone pair. So here is SF4. So I had to move one column to the right on the periodic table in order to achieve a single lone pair. And notice, by the way, that since I'm now invoking d orbitals for these expanded octets, I can no longer be making these molecules with uh, central atoms that are from the second period of the periodic table. They're really not, uh, quote unquote, close enough to being able to utilize their d orbitals. So here I am with sulfur as my central atom. And these two plus 
a lone pair that would be right here, they would be that central ring that's all in the same plane. And this would be what I used to refer to as the top and then this the bottom. You can see, and I mentioned this before, that you actually have more room being on this central ring of atoms. That's why the lone pair is going to appear right here. You will not find lone pairs using either the top or bottom locations because they are more confined and the lone pair takes up more physical room than a bonded atom. Because of that more physical room, you also get this situation where these atoms here and here are actually pushed ever so slightly away from being collinear. So as far as symmetry is concerned, we might still talk about them more or less being linear, but indeed they are actually pushed a little bit away from that. To draw this one, what I like to do is line up one, two, three, and then my lone pair in the plane of the paper, and again, just have my single solid wedge that's coming out and my wedge that's going in. Here we can see what it looks like when I show the full electron density. Again, my lone pair would be sitting over here. Uh, and if I want to talk about the electron cloud, I must include it. So I would have trigonal bipyramidal, but the overall shape for just the atoms here, we would call seesaw. You could picture how this would be the base of a seesaw and this could wobble back and forth up and down. So that's where the name comes from for that one. Our next shape is going to have five total pairs again, but this time we're going to have two of them be lone pairs. I'm going to use ClF3 for this example. We call this T-shaped. You can see why it's T-shaped there. This is what I would be calling the top and the bottom. So here I'm showing you the top and here's the bottom. Remember, lone pairs are going to prefer to take positions that are on that central ring, that plane, that hula hoop around the top and the bottom. And so we would have one that's existing here and we would have one that's existing behind, both a little bit out of the plane of the page right now. And in fact, that's how I think I'm gonna to choose to draw this one, where you can see one, two, three, four things in the plane of the page. And I will do what I can to indicate a lone pair here and one back going behind. Go ahead and turn on the electron density here so that you can see that. Remember, lone pairs actually hug pretty close to the central atom. And so don't necessarily believe the, the big puffy loop with the two dots that we put in it for it somehow representing actual size of the thing. But so we do have a lone pair that's out here and that one's coming down here. The electron cloud itself is going to take a trigonal bipyramidal shape, whereas again, we have a T shape when it comes to the actual molecule itself with the atoms. Just for giggles, I'll show you that if you wanted to get the two lone pairs in the plane of the page, it would probably look something like this. So one atom in the plane of the page, the central of course in the plane, then we would have a lone pair that's going up like this and one that's coming down like this. And so we have our dashed wedge going behind and we have our solid wedge coming out. The last series of geometries that we're gonna talk about are things that have six either atoms or lone pairs hanging off. Generally speaking, that geometry is called octahedral. I will start by showing you sulfur hexafluoride here. So I have a central sulfur and then I have six different fluorines hanging off of that. Now, all of these fluorines are actually experiencing the exact same situation. No matter which fluorine I focus in on, it has four other fluorines that are 90 degrees away from it. And so everything is the same here. That's kind of nice because when lone pairs start to come in on this overall general geometry, it will not matter where they go and you will see that. Or at least the first one won't matter where it goes. Drawing these in two dimensions is pretty straightforward. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna line up one, two, three, four, five different atoms in the plane of the page and then I will have one solid wedge coming out and one dashed wedge going back behind. So again, octahedral geometry for the atoms. And you can see here an octahedral geometry that's gonna mirror or mimic the atoms themselves when we're talking about the electron cloud. Okay, next we're gonna move one column to the right on the periodic table so that we can get an extra valence electron and have one side that does not need to share electrons can just be a nice lone pair. 
Okay, we'll do an iodine pentafluoride for this one. You can see that here. Remember I said since all of the things in the general octahedral geometry are existing in the same environment, the first set of the first lone pair to attack the thing is not actually going to have any preferred location. And so you can obviously tell where it would be right now. It would be right in front coming out of the page if this is directly behind. Now again, lone pairs actually take up a little bit more room. And so if you look carefully, you will notice that there is a slight bend to these. All four of these fluorines here are being pushed a little bit further away. If I wanna draw this in two dimensions, I might, for example, put my lone pair pointing up just to kind of keep it out of the way. And then I have one, two, three, four atoms that are in the plane of the page one solid wedge and one dashed wedge. Okay, again, the electron cloud would have that lone pair that's up here, filling in an electron cloud that is octahedral in shape. Remember that lone pair is actually hugging in the atomic orbitals of the central atom, and so it's actually fairly close to the atom itself. We've got room to move over one more column, so now we will have a noble gas that is the central atom. We will have two lone pairs and we will have four bonding pairs with six uh, pairs total in this expanded octet. And here we will have xenon tetrafluoride for the example molecule. Again, the overall shape, the octahedral shape. I have my first lone pair that comes in. It doesn't really matter where it is. When you have a second lone pair, it will tend to be opposite because there is going to be a benefit. It's gonna be able to spread out the most Again, so it's, it doesn't have to be right next to another big, large, lone pair. So a drawing this can also be very easy. Uh, I tend to like to put the lone pairs going up and down, and then you can see my one, two, three other atoms that are in the plane of the page, and I will have my solid wedge and my dashed wedge. So this geometry you can see here, it's planar. Everything here is 90 degrees, and then it's probably no surprise that we would call this square planar. So here's the square, and there's the plane. And again, here's the electron cloud, and I would have a lone pair that's sitting up here, and I would have another lone pair that's sitting down there, so that we can see everything. That's all that I had in mind. I hope you guys got some use out of that. Remember I did the first, uh, looks like five here in a previous video, and then I just covered these last six so that you could see the geometries, what we actually call all of them, and hopefully get a little bit of a helpful hint on how to draw them in two dimensions. So if everything made sense, which I hope it did, let your computer know.